This week's episode is brought to you by our beautiful friends at CoinSpot, Australia's home base for cryptocurrency, trusted by over 2.5 million customers, including me. It's the easiest place to buy, sell, and store your cryptocurrency. Use the code DIL, that's D Y L, 123, and receive $10 worth of Bitcoin after your first deposit. Billy XX. Joe Watson, how are you going? Good, mate. How are you? Mate, very well. Welcome to Dylan Friends. This is incredible. So excited to have you in. Thank you for having me. Looking um, forward to it. I don't know if I've ever met anyone named Joe before besides you. I was just thinking about it on the way in. Is that true? Like, do you know any other Jobs? Uh, I don't know any other Jobs that are older than me. Yeah, okay. yeah. So, um, so he's saying they're named after you. Yeah. Well, I've met a few <laughs> Essendon people who brought their kids <laughs> to the <laughs> kids to the club and said, "This is Job." I thought, "Oh God, it's a." I mean, if you if you know the heritage of the name, it's um, it's not a great story. You what know, is it's, it? it's out of the Old Testament. So the um, the patience of Job is what it's referencing, and um, Job. Uh, was a very prosperous um, sort of uh, high society person and then his life became very difficult and uh, the patience of Job is that uh, he never um, wavered from his belief in, in his uh in, in God and and all these challenges that he had in his life, he never um, turned on God, and that is the 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 story of the Old Testament. That's awesome. It was spelt J O B, so my parents put an E on in, ca- in yeah. case they thought I was going to be called Job. Job. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I um I re- I regret bringing this story up already because I'm a poor kid that this happened to. But I remember one day at a Carlton clinic, and this was before I'd even played any games, and yeah, you know, I think they saw a lot of potential, and unfortunately for this family, they. <laughs> did this sort of impulsive decision to name their child Dylan Buckley. Oh, right. And then the last name. I won't repeat the last name, but the yeah. middle name is actually Buckley. So well. I don't know if they've changed the name since, <laughs> but the kid's name, I'm, I swear on my life, was named Dylan Buckley, then their last name. Uh, and this is like my first year into the system. <laughs> I think like there, there would have been six years there and then probably after thinking, fuck me, did we make the wrong decision <laughs> with this of naming our kid? Not just Dylan, but like Dylan Buckley. It's the it's like the people who name their kids Daenerys after the first couple of seasons of, <laughs> of Game of Thrones and then as the arc changed, they started to regret it. There was a lot of uh, there was a lot of dogs that were named Job. And I think that's a better way of doing yeah, it. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> that's fantastic. Um, mate, you're an extremely busy man. We really do appreciate your time today. You, you're doing a lot of things, which I love. I love people that are just engaged and have so many different things going on, which I can't wait to talk to you about today. Um, what's keeping you busy? Uh, well, we just had our third child, so that's probably the, the top one. of the tree at the moment. So what have you got at the moment too? We've got a girl, boy, girl. Girl, boy, girl. Yep. It's a good mix. Yeah, it's a nice mix. So we uh, we had one of each and then went for a number three, but uh, yeah, we're, we're happy and uh, Q in the rack now. Yeah. <laughs> Three's a lot. It's a good number, I feel. I, was a, you... child, I was a child of two. Okay. Child of two. I was a... One of two? two? Part of two, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I had a sister, an older sister, but I think three's a good mix because if you fight with one of them, you've still got the other one to sort of go with and yep. you're in there a bit. Yeah, I was one of four, so I had three younger sisters. So yes. um, three feels uh, feels right. I actually know your sister, Grace, funnily enough. we I'd never – I knew it was your sister, but I just forgot about, you know, how I knew her because it just wasn't through a footy circle at all. Yeah. I've got an embarrassingly funny story about um, actually meeting your sister, Grace, when I was with her and I'd had a couple of beers. And this was back in the day when I was getting into selling merch and mer- my merch for the business and I was doing all the pick packing <laughs> for my merch and I worked out that she worked at Oz Post. Oh, yeah. At the time. Yeah. I'm not sure she's still there. Yep. And in my extremely naive brain thinking, oh, you know, she might be able to get me like a Help discount at like Oz Post or something here <laughs> until I realised that Oz Post is about a business of 10,000 people <laughs> and she worked at like the head office. She wasn't working in the discount section of giving me Behind disc- a counter yeah. sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny the what, what your mind goes to, like when you feel like there's an opportunity, especially when you're starting yeah. a business or new in a business, you think there's an angle here for yeah. me. And yeah. like capitalise oh, on I'm that. paying seven bucks, you might be able to get me to 650 or something. <laughs> And I just was like, she would have given you a pretty vacant response. Oh, she was so good. It yeah. was fantastic. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that was embarrassing. I wish I said that was the last time that I've done something like that before, but it's very, very common for myself. Mm. Um, your business ventures as well. You've got a couple going on at the moment. What's happening? Yeah, busy at the moment. Um, we launched uh, Morning Joe, which is an instant coffee business mm. that I started with a couple of friends. Um, and we... 2019, we started investigating it and the idea that instant coffee potentially could be um, changed or delivered or could be better, mm. could we make it better? And uh, so we went through a two-year process of, of sourcing the, the coffee, found it, um, that they the best one we found was in Germany. So they uh, they do a 
the roast, they get the beans from South America and then they roast it um, in Germany and then freeze dry it. So a lot of the coffee that in the instant variety is um, chemically uh, dried to get the most to extract the most flavor out of the beans. Right. They freeze dry it over in Germany, so we we get it from there and we we bring it over uh, and then we package it here. So we just we sold out of our first batch. We just released our, our second batch and and that process, which is the thing I most enjoy about business, is the the process of learning a new skill mm. um, and and to build an online business, to build an online brand, um, to go through those steps. Um, it's been a, a really fun journey, and uh, and so that's that's keeping me really busy at the morning. Uh, morning Joe, yeah, I love it. I've you, I've actually tried a, a bit of it as well, and I, I'm not just saying it, it is awesome. I think um, you're onto something here because, as you would know, but coffee obviously is ingrained in our culture, but instant coffee is making such a like come back mm. and I am using this at home now cause I'm really into like just like long blacks or short blacks. I don't really like drinking a lot of milk these milk, days. Yeah. So like I like to just have it bang with some water, taste unbelievable and it's there. Yeah. And I think the, the there's that element of it that the people are a little bit more conscious of the amount of milk that yeah. they consume. Um, and uh, I guess what goes into um, making a liter of almond milk, for example, yeah. you know, there's a lot of water and stuff like that that, that is required. Um, the convenience of it, uh, and then frankly, the, the cost of, of of coffee is is expensive, um, and it's been appreciating in value. So the idea was, can we um, can we get a, a better quality instant? Uh, can we have sustainable packaging, um, and then can we do an online? business and make it commercial and uh that was the the preface of, of starting the business and um we're still in its infancy but it's mm. been a really fun process so far do you love being on e-com like e-com for me has opened up so i just love being mm. able to work online yep. in a way and like have websites and and stuff like the fuck there's some learnings that you can really you can really cook it um, yeah with orders and stuff especially if you, your postage isn't getting looked after <laughs> well the first uh, so our first batch i was uh we were all packaging all ourselves. So we had um, all the, the boxes and the sachets at home and we'd walk down to Aussie Post, I'd take the kids over. Was Grace there? Uh, no, no, Grace didn't work <laughs> in this one. Well, I had, I had a, a, a pram with two kids yeah. in it at the time and I got six or seven boxes trying to, you know, put it over the counter and things like that. And that is the fun part of, uh, yeah. you know, starting your own business, isn't it? You, yeah. you learn the, the the intricacies of it and, and the nitty gritty. Um, and so uh, that's been a, it's been a really fun Fun thing to do. So exciting. You know, the one thing I love about this, and I, I'm very, in a way, I think I, 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 there's a there's a positive, positive in this somewhere. I'm a very materialistic person. Mm. And I, but I appreciate the finer things, but the branding of your business, did you have anything to do with that? Well, I can't say I had a lot to do yeah, with okay. it. One of the, the business partners, she is, um, she's got her own marketing and advertising beautiful. Um, business and uh, and she's been the driver of that. Yeah. So uh, I can't take any of that credit. Um, Bonnie has done an amazing job with, uh, with how it looks and how it feels. And, you know, when you're building something online, yes, you, you want to have, obviously you want to have a great product, but you want that product to then the branding and the feel of the product to resonate and for it to translate as well. So yeah. you, you can't have a, I don't think you, you can have a great product as an online business and then not have it feel or look great too. I think um, it's really important. Oh, it is. It is. And it, it, the way it is now, we're attracted to things like you're not going to like something that you don't you're not attracted to when you, you see it on the shelf or, yep. or online. Is it mainly online at the moment? Mainly online at the right, moment. Morningjoe.com.au? We'll, we'll, yep. And awesome. uh, we're looking, you know, hopefully at uh, more of a retail presence later on. Unbelievable. I'm sure we'll get to the origins of the, the story and maybe the origins of the story. I don't know if it if it is, but um, with the US trip, but I wouldn't mind yep. going back to the start anyway. Um, what were you like as a kid? Um, I was pretty shy. Pretty shy kid, um, and but but love my sport. Um, spent all my time, you know, playing all kinds of sport, that sort of thing. Didn't love school. I loved uh, the, um, I guess, the camaraderie of school yeah. and uh, the, the travel, getting to and from school. <laughs> but the, the time spent there, I was probably not the most studious, studious kid. But uh, I had a very, you know, very happy upbringing, and uh, you know, very sort of, uh, I guess, um, sheltered a life down in Sandy. Yeah, what what? Because um, you're a Xavier boy. Yep. Did you go there the whole time? Yeah. So Costco, um, which was from year five to eight, and then the the over to Q campus. 
Wow. Yeah. And uh, that's where infamously is like, obviously I feel like we've had everyone that's connected to you on the show besides yourself, but Ted Richards, yep. good friend of yours. Who else was in your year at that? Cause there was a few guys that yeah. got charged, wasn't it? Was it uh, was Luke Ball? Ball. Yeah, Luke Ball, Ball was we, we were, um, from year five at Costco all the way through to, um, the senior school. So he, he was there. Um, then there was a couple other, uh, guys who were sort of older and a couple younger as well. We, I, we were just above sort of the, the Hanbury's and uh, Josh Kennedy, those sort of guys. Yeah, wow. um, we were a couple of years above them. What were you, um, what were you like as a, as a junior coming through? Like, were you always interested in footy? Was it always going to be a possibility? Obviously your father, Tim is a, is a, you know, Essendon hero, AFL hero and, and prominent in the media now, but was it always looking like you're actually going to get picked up? No, I don't think so. I think it was, um, it was more, I, I love playing footy, um, but I probably uh, wasn't, I wasn't the best, you know, a junior growing up. Uh, I developed a bit later um, and I, I loved the game, but uh, I probably didn't take it seriously. Um, and I think one of the things I found as I got, um, you know, older and was in the AFL system longer and longer, I found that it, it was a common theme that um, the father-son kids were late developers or, or not mm. always sort of like so so driven. And, and for me, the personal experience was a, a, that there was that trepidation or fear that you know if you um outwardly told or spoke about how much you wanted to play the game that you would always be compared to your, your parents or your father and that um you wouldn't uh if you were unsuccessful it was seen as a real failure mm. and so i think that i probably hidden hid the desire and that probably translated to a later development um and i found that there was when father sons came in, I would always see that they weren't sort of, you know, necessarily like the, the kids who'd been in the gym since 15 or um, really well developed as 18, 19 year olds. Like they, they had, uh, uh, and I just wondered whether or not there was that similarity of it was the personality or the, the trepidation of the, the father being sort of overbearing mm. and outwardly telling people too much that you wanted it and then being so fear of the failure. That's really interesting. I've like never really thought about it like that at all. But while we go on this topic, obviously I was mm. a father son pick as well. Um, what was it like for you? Well, that's like, what I'm just thinking. I'm trying to put myself in those shoes. Like, I'd be interested to know. Firstly, was your old man was was Tim always sort of what was he like in that scenario? Because like my old man never really pushed me to do anything. And I think I look back now, it's the best worst thing. Mm -hmm. Like my parents are too loving. I've said yep. this a lot. Like they just they'd be happy with me doing anything. They're just mm. like whatever you want to do you can do it. Like yep. as long as, um, I was happy and I think that it was really good, but I look back and think, fuck, I wish they sort of pushed me a bit more. Cause I was so young and naive. I just had no fucking idea. Yeah. I had no idea. Yeah. Like when I got to a club, I'd, I, I embarrassingly say this, but like I got to the AFL and didn't know that there were such things as off season programs. Yeah. I was just so unaware of yeah. like what it was, what it took. Yep. And I think people probably when I was there, they thought that I just knew this stuff because, you know, my dad had played footy. But yeah. I actually had no idea. Yeah. No, very similar for me. I was really naive when I first arrived at the club. And I think that, um, you know, my parents were the same. They didn't want to be overbearing. They, mm. they didn't want to push me into something that I didn't necessarily wanted to do. So they probably, um, to balance that out, they were too much the other way as well. They just said, you know, go and do ha and be happy. And um, you, you probably, like to, to come in and be really successful at the AFL system at, at 18, you, you probably need to be driven, you know, like 15, 16, 17 yeah. to be able to step in. Um, and I was, it was very much the same. Like footy was, I, I did it because I loved it, um, but it was all because I loved it, not because someone else wanted me to play it. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I think about this a lot with, with, with sport and, and even just life in general, like whatever you want to do, you've got to have that passion for it. And I think for me, um, that's, you know, that's not uh, breaking any news on that. I think we, we're all aware. But the one thing that I loved about um, seeing players come through and the ones that do really well, not just in business, but in life in general, the ones that are most grateful for the opportunity. And I loved seeing like rookies come through and mm -hmm. they're these, you know, guys and girls that have done it the hard way. They're extremely grateful for the opportunity and they don't, go, they don't think they've got time. Yeah. Like people who know... You know, I thought I had time. Yes. And a, a lot. And now I don't. Like, I've, the, my biggest lesson was going, you know, like, I've got time. Like, I'm a young kid. I'm developing. Mm. Whereas I, everyone else comes in and they're like, no time. Yeah. No age. No age um, limits. No time. Let's fucking get it done now. Yep. Yeah. Because a lot of people say, it annoys me a lot when people say, you've got to have patience in life. And I think you do have to have patience, but you've also got to be in a rush while being patient. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think so. I think that, like when you when you're learning a new skill, you have to be patient with yourself. Mm. That um, it's not something you don't just land at the top of the mountain. 
you, you've, you've got to, there is that incremental learnings that are going on, but you can be in a rush to get to, you know, appreciate in those learnings. Yeah. You know, you can, you can make those steps quickly, but understand that you're still climbing a ladder. Your first couple of years, was that with Sheedy? Yep. That's unbelievable. Yeah. It feels like a it feels like an long time ago. Yeah. 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 Were you in a rush with him? Like what no, were you like when you first no, got I there? was re- probably very similar to yeah. you. Really uh, quite a sheltered kid, private school, you know, mm. um, and walked into the AFL system. Very naive. Um, you know, didn't understand what the work ethic was like. Uh, play, played some games, but, you know, had, had injuries, wasn't really was floundering in my career really mm. going nowhere probably fortunate that um you're uh offered more time back then than what kids are now um so uh there was you know was three years of really sort of not doing a whole lot in my first three three years of footy mm. but they play as a key forward back then as yeah. well yeah yeah so yeah. it was a i guess um yeah key forward and uh i played midfield um sort of under 17s, 18s, but um, just didn't have the endurance to play in that position at the um, elite level. What what changed? Because I have this really weird memory, and I don't know if this is true or not. I, it just like sticks out in my mind of you talking about one preseason. There was like a you know pivotal moment where it could have gone either way, and you started doing boxing. Yep. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. It yeah. was. It was like the Robert Frost fork yeah. in the road, yeah. um, and uh, and it was. It was my parents, and it was Dad in particular. And Dad knew, you know, your parents know you better than anyone else, and they know how to trigger a reaction from you. And uh, for me, it was, uh, you know, he just said to me at the end of the two thousand and five season, he said, you know, uh, you know, Mum and Dad, we don't, we don't care what you do. Um, and you don't have to play footy just because I did, but what you're doing is you're actually doing yourself a disservice mm. and you're embarrassing yourself. And, uh, wow. yeah. And, and that was, you know, I sulked like anyone would, you know, like a 20 year old goes and sulks and, uh, but eventually I stewed on it and I said, well, if you were in my position, what would you do? And he introduced me to a boxing coach called Ray Giles. And that was the, the, the change, you know, and being able to, you know, incredibly thankful, one for the the conversation that I have with Dad, but two for that uh, you know someone like Ray, who was a uh, you know a boxing coach, went out of his, out on uh, of his way to um, you know to teach me about training and to teach me about work ethic and to teach me about um, pushing yourself through um, you know pain barriers and uh, and so I trained with these boxers from the end of the two thousand five season. Um, and train sort of with them three times a week until preseason started, and then kept training with them as uh, uh, on top of the preseason that I was doing at Essendon. Unreal! What like what a gift, and what a cool moment! Like sharing that with your old man and your mum, for them to say you're embarrassing yourself. Like <laughs> as in, I think any kid that's like a worst nightmare back when you're sort of 20 years of age, getting feedback like that. Yeah, you look back and it's like. How pivotal has that been for everything? Yeah. And it wasn't just, you know, you're embarrassing yourself, but it's also, you know, like you, you don't need to do this for us. Yeah. You know, like it's it's your life. Um, the decisions that you make are the ones uh, are to be made by you. Um, we're here to provide guidance and help when you need it, if you want it. But in the end, you have to stand on your own two yeah. feet. And that's, that's it's one of the great things about um, competitive sport, isn't it? It, 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 it is, it's, it balances out all the other external things of life. Um, no matter where you came from, the game doesn't know any of those things. It only knows performance. And the performance is driven by the athletes themselves invariably. And they get to decide what the level of performance they, the output they give. Mm. Yeah. No one cares what happens during the week when you step out there. No. And no one cares what your background is. No one cares what the, well, the game doesn't, the game is the great equalizer of society. And that's why I think people love it because it, because it, it doesn't have any um, preconceived ideas and uh, it just lets the game is the game. Yeah. I love that. Um, with Ray Giles, yep. What was the biggest lesson with him? I think you did mention before around that be able to push through pain barriers. But was there like what what was it like going down there the first time, and what was sort of by the end? How did you sort of feel yourself transform? Well, I mean, Ray was a really um, experienced not not only just um, it's almost like a life coach, you know, like the the best fitness guys. Yeah. I think before his time, coach. probably. Yeah, correct. And yeah. and he he had all this experience of teaching guys who'd never boxed before and turned them into fighters. So yeah, right. he'd gone through those processes. He understood that you don't just throw someone to the to the lines and then you actually have to build them up. You have to teach them how to build themselves yeah. up, and uh, and that's what he did for me. And and 
uh, by the end, you know, like he used to talk all the way about, uh, you know, you, you got to get to that dark place. You got to live in there, and that's where that's where champions are made. You know, like because that's where you have to be. Um, a lot of people get close to it, but they don't want to stay there. Uh, and that was the mentality that he he was to instill. And so by the end of it, when you put in so much work and you've 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 done so much you just have this uh, enormous self-confidence and self-belief in what you've done and that preparation that, and that work that you've put in that uh, it's like a you just want more of it it's like an insatiable appetite to, to get there uh, and so I think that you get to a stage where people see what you're doing and think it's almost crazy because they can't understand it. But for you, it's like that's where you need to be. You know, it's, it doesn't seem like that. It's, it's out of the ordinary. It's something that's very normal for you to be there. And that's where I think you, you get to a, a level of that. In, in, in our world, it was you know professional sport. But you get to a level where it, it, you're so comfortable in a, in a place where most people think you – it's absurd that you, you, why are you there? What are you doing? You, you must, there must be something wrong with you. Mm. Um, and that's probably the way in which you separate yourself from, you know, other people. Do you remember a time, the first time maybe that that actually translated into on field? Yeah, I do. I, I remember it sort of, it was pre, the preseason when I came back, you know, in 2006 and it was like every, the preseason felt easy for me. And that had been such a, different for you know from when yeah. i had started you know everything was an absolute slog i used to give they used to give me a, uh, my first year they gave me a, a seven minute head start around the maribyrnong <laughs> and i was the last one that came in you know like that's that's how poor you know my conditioning was um and uh but that so the the results of the work were, were quite immediate because it felt like process and felt sort of easy and i actually was doing the boxing on top of the preseason because I felt like that was the workload that I needed. Mm. Um, so that was uh, – I, and I guess when you get results like that quite instantly, then you start to you start to feel like there's there's been some work that's really helped. Yeah, it's hard, isn't it, like when you, you have the reward for effort and sometimes it's not linear though, is mm. it? Like it does that's take right. longer to, to see those benefits and you do have ups and downs and peaks and troughs of, of that yep. throughout the time. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I remember uh, it got to the stage where that pre, you know, sort of after all that work, I used to go to bed at night and say, "Look, please don't get um, injured the next day at training," because you, I had put in so much work, you know, like that was my my mm. greatest fear was that I'd get injured to undo the work that I'd done because I you'd invested so much in it. What was um what was Kevin Sheedy like as a coach? I feel like we've come such a, you know, to have maybe one of the oldest uh you know coaches for a long time at, at the par at the pies at um Essendon to now uh, the game sort of transformed into that modern coach I feel like he was probably the last one of the last coaches of that ilk yeah I think so I think um look I I probably had a difficult sort of relationship with him in mm. that I didn't get a great connection with him and and I found it ha him hard to communicate with but the one thing that I always had from Sheets he always inspired me to play for him you know like I always wanted to play for him, I never, um, I could never really get a straight answer out of him, and I found him very difficult to talk to. But he would always, I always felt inspired by him, and and even uh, when we did the 150 anniversary um, for the club, he got. Uh, like a group of about uh, 10 or 12 players in there, ex-players, and spoke to us before we went out. And he still had the same effect yeah. on me. You know, like you don't – he just didn't lose that. And I think that um, he was obviously uh, an incredible uh, coach over his period of time. And, and as he as he got older and the, and what I saw of him were probably was very different to the, the, the coach that dad had from him when he mm. arrived at the club in the 80s. But he still had the ability – to inspire you to play for him, which I think is one of the most important attributes for any coach. The yeah, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Like I, I don't, I never played for Essendon, so I don't know this at all. But you see him now, and he still does carry some of those mm. those things. But I've seen lately as well, and I suppose we're jumping around a little bit here. But how important it must be for Essendon now to nearly break away from that and be able to forge a new path. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think you can get caught up in your history in the too history. much. Yeah, and, and, and Carlton did the same thing. Yeah, and these enormous figures 
um, they they weigh they can weigh heavily on the club because mm. people are always looking back at them as the answers when you need to form a new path. And uh, you know, like Essendon did it once before. They they had like these Coleman Reynolds type figures. Then they had a twenty year period of uh, like uh, of no success through the the late sixties and seventies, and then Sheeds forged a new path. Yeah, you know, so it, history is you know the saying history doesn't repeat itself but often rhymes like they're actually doing the same thing that they did in the the 60s and 70s um they just probably are still thinking that the answers are in the past when it, it needs to be that they need to back someone else for the future yeah it's i think we we get to especially in sport we we're romantics yeah, and we, we, all, we always yeah. want to come back to what we know and what we think is going to be better because you always remember the good things. You don't remember the other things. That's in, right. In sport. I've seen this happen so many times. Yeah, well, especially it's life, at isn't it? It's you life. Know? It's everything. Yeah, that we do. I mean, I find Southback one of my favourite shows in the season with the the member berries. Like it's just they're geniuses, you know, because that's what they do. People just think that because when they were doing something, when their life was better or easier, or they were in their twenties, so that everything was better. It must have been better back then. Yeah. You know, like if it's not the case, <laughs> it's just that the life that you were living at the moment was better. Well, so they try and tap into that nostalgia. It's so funny as well. People like again, sort of on that topic, like people always, oh, you know, movie tickets were so much cheaper back in the days. Like. You were paying kids' prices back in the day. You know, like they're actually – like the inflation, and yes, they have gone up, but you're yeah. also paying a cheaper ticket. That's right. Um, which was which is interesting on that topic. Um, on Essendon at the moment, where, where, do they, where do they need to go? Like what, there's been a couple of coaches pull out recently. Mm-hmm. Do, you, do you have anyone in mind that you think would be good for the job? Like what, what are you – it's hard to pick someone at the yeah. moment. Yeah. No, I don't have any sp- particular person that I, I think is good. I, I think that there's probably some um, – some very good coaches who don't want to coach anymore. Mm. Um, and I think that's a, a real negative of the, re, the and a reflection of the industry and how difficult it is for a coach. Like I think when you get people who, who should be still coaching, who are very good coaches, but are saying, I don't want to do this anymore, or uh, this is not healthy for me. That's a pretty damning reflection of the industry. I think what, to answer the question, I think what Essendon need to do is they need to um, they under, they really need to understand where they're at, and I don't think that they know exactly where they're at at the moment. And you can't know where you're at, you can't go forward until you know exactly where you're starting from. And I think that they have misrepresented themselves in believing something that hasn't been true about where they're actually at. So I would I would look at where are we at, give ourselves perspective based off that, and then choose the right people. Or, or choose people in the roles that are the most important in a football club who all share the same collective belief about where to go and the path forward. Um, and I think the best way to do that, though, is to really ask yourself and to find out where you're starting from. Mm. And that's what I would do. Yeah. It's an, and look, it's, all, it's never as bad as you think. It's never no. as good as you think. And it's it's an exciting time for them, I think, because you can really for for once they're probably going to be forced to actually really do that. Whereas yes. you know, like I, again, I refer this to Carlton because they've gone through it for a long time as well. But it's like you can hover around that in the middle is nearly worse than bottoming out. Yeah, because you still have that belief that you think, oh, we might just be one or two players away from getting back up. Yes, and I think now it's an actually exciting time for Essendon and Essendon supporters because you go, you know what, fuck it, we're not there now. Yeah, like we're, we actually have to be honest with ourselves. We need to start again. What do we do? Do we need to get rid of some players and bring in young young things? It could be quicker than me, you know. You think? I think it will be um, if they get the right people in the right roles. And, yeah. and I think that that the idea of if you find out exactly where you're at and whether you use someone external or you, you go through and a review is fine to do mm. that. But if if you can do that and then you can get alignment, so you can go from the board to the uh, the CEO to the the general manager of football to the d- recruiting department to the the coaching department as well, and you say, listen, we we, we this is where we're at. And we feel like over the next five years, we can build a really sustainable, high-quality environment and a Mm. a high-quality club. Now, if you don't feel like you want to be part of that timeline, for example, if it's five years, then it's probably best not to be here. And so if you can get alignment from that down, then I think you give yourself a really good chance. I mean, the, the, the clearest thing is that you need stability and continuity of, of your people mm. in, those, in those really important roles to be able to have sustained success. High draft picks don't give you sustained success. No. Um, uh, constant turnover of personnel does not give you sustained success. Um, so 
those are the key pillars is how I view it. I actually read a book um, recently, Good to Great, who yep. um, Ted Richards actually spoke about on yeah. his podcast, uh, the podcast I did with him. And that book reflects so much on footy in general and I think leadership in general in footy, like CEOs being like reactive yep. or people in, in business being reactive. And even, like this is just jumping all over the shop today, but in, in business in life, like reactiveness, we speak about this a, a lot in footy. It's just like someone sacks someone to then hire someone else and that person wants to make the decisions and then they fuck up and then they get sacked. And it's just like a never ending, cycle. a never ending cycle. And you yeah. look at the best clubs like Geelong and maybe Richmond of late swans. and the Swans. See, they don't even come into it because you just no. don't even think about what's happening there. Yeah. But they just back their people in and they don't panic and they see things through. Yeah. And they build, they build, um, uh, programs or uh, they build an environment where there's progress and to, to be able to hire internally. So they build succession plans yeah. internally, there you, you know, go. like, and so the continuity stays. Um, it is, it is, it's, it's a wonderful um, industry, the AFL, but it, it makes really smart people dumb because mm. they get, they get emotive about it. Yeah. The reason why people love the game so much and it's so popular is the same reason why you see all these really smart people make dumb decisions. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, 100%. Don't. Yeah, <laughs> very true. <laughs> um, back to you, mate. 2006. Yep. Breakout year. Second in the BNF. What did that do for you? Um, I just – Sides I, I a think, bonus. Yeah, <laughs> so, <laughs> which I spent <laughs> at, at Oktoberfest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it just gave some validation to that I always thought I was good enough. I always felt like I was a good enough player to play at AFL and have mm. a good career. Um, so it gave me that validation and it, and it it laid that platform for, I guess, the the work that I needed to get better. Um, but I felt like I'd um, sort of broken out of um, the mediocrity that I'd been in. Big shout out to our friends at CoinSpot, Australia's home base for cryptocurrency. We love CoinSpot. They've been such incredibly huge supporters of Dylan Friends and the community over the past couple of years, and we cannot thank them enough for their love and support. They sponsored and partnered with us on Tour Dead DAF and also a community giveaway coming this year, which we cannot wait to uh, to share, which is really cool. So if you've got a local club that needs some upgrading, stay tuned for that one because I'm really excited to uh, to announce something that we're doing with CoinSpot to deck out your club very, very soon. CoinSpot trusts by over 2.5 million customers. It's the easiest place to buy, sell, and store your cryptocurrency. So if you're looking into cryptocurrency like myself, use the code DIL, D-Y-L-1-2-3, and receive $10 worth of Bitcoin after your first deposit. Head to coinspot.com.au and sign up now. The link will also be in the show notes. Illy. What was it like for your strength of playing like we said before like aerobic at the start wasn't your best attribute you mm. worked on it a lot like how much did that contribute to you playing your best footy did you find that you were actually running a lot in games or was it more just like stoppages and getting to contests yeah b um, bit of both I, I felt like it was um the major flaw in my game mm. was my um lack of uh fitness and uh i thought that that was um once, once I was able to, you know, take that away as a negative, then my my the other areas of my game sort of started to flourish because I just couldn't repeat the efforts in games. Yeah. Um. And I would just my my contribution, my output would just uh, waver so quickly because I just didn't have the capability to to play continuously at that high level. Do you think though as well that like there's a there's a, a part of this in sport like that work hard and not, uh, work smart and not harder like you can be fit but also smart running like is something because I spoke to um, a former teammate of yours um, about how you used to run and it was very strategic like it was quite smart you didn't d run to dumb spots so you weren't wasting energy on things that you didn't have to waste your energy on. Yep. Yeah. Was I mean, that conscious like for yourself? Uh, well I always felt like my Best attribute was my intelligence, yeah. my, my game smarts. Um, and so I would, you know, like pe the guys, most of my teammates would laugh at me when they saw the GPS after a game. You yeah, know, what like were you it, running? Uh, well, Because I've heard, you, I, <laughs> can I say, this is what I was getting with this. I heard in your like peak form year, there were some games where you're running like eight kilometers a game. Some sometimes, yeah. Which, uh, uh, yeah. Can I put the context for people? Like that is fucked. Like I ran sixteen k's once and had three touches. So, like, that, that's just put in context what's happening. You're having like forty five and running nearly probably three a quarter less than any other elite midfielder in the game. But I think it's it could be seen as that. But I think it's more around the intelligence of actually just getting into good spots and not needing to overwork. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I just to me, it was always sort of like there was some. The game was, you know, like there was simplicity of decision making, you know, and so I always felt like the uh, the game was be, uh, uh, my best contribution to the team was to to have the ball in my hands in the right spots, mm. and that um, that meant that you know, like I, I would be, yeah, if if I didn't feel like I was in a position where there was. It was going to impact, or my man wasn't in a position to impact. Then I wouldn't be going there. I wouldn't run there. Um, and yeah, I guess the, the the guys used to make fun of me about it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> it's unbelievable. Well, it, really it was is. just. I mean, it was. I mean, I got better at it, mm. um, but it was never like I was never like a, a, an animal that would be you know sixteen kilometers that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, you know, twelve to thirteen was absolute max. But there were games where yeah, it was certainly below ten. And still racking him up. <laughs> well, I used to say it's easy to know where your man is when he's hanging off the back of you. <laughs> so the, the, Diesel taught me that. He said I'd, I never had to worry where my man was. He was just behind me. <laughs> that's so good. Um, 2010, that's when he took over the captaincy. Yep. Leadership to you. Um, what does it mean? What sort of leader were you? Um, I'm not just saying this now, but like for me, you you know, I think without even playing under you, I just think you, you use leadership. Um, I'd be interested in knowing what, what your thoughts were, like what were you like as a, as a captain and what do you think that your players would say about you? Uh, I really enjoyed leadership mm. um, and I didn't think I was ready for it when it was given to me, but um, it was there was validation in the process where I had older teammates who were part of the leadership group vote me as the captain. So that certainly helps. And I had a great, um, you know, well, Andrew Welsh, who, um, you know, is a good friend and a longtime teammate. He was the vice captain and, and he was someone that I could always turn to and, and, and ask for, for help, especially when you're, when you're sort of a younger captain. Um, but it is so certainly something that you, you learn to get, you get better at as you get older. Um, I think that I would be described as uh, a hands-on uh, leader. I felt like I was very fair and I always felt like the most important thing of the attribute for a good leader for me was that uh, I had the respect of the group, um, but that respect was based off uh, a strength of relationship mm. and that I felt like I treated everyone equally uh, and that I gave the time and that my teammates felt like I cared about them. Mm. That was what um, I always thought was the most important thing about leadership. I think any young leader that gets put into that position, there's always times where you go back and think, fuck, I learned a lot from this. I could have done this differently or anything like that. Was there any big learnings as a leader that you think, look, you look back now and think, fuck yeah, I could have been better at that? Yeah, yeah. there certainly was. Yeah. I think that especially when you're dealing with, um, you know, like if you have a, a controversy or uh, a punishment or like, you know, something where someone's done something wrong and you've got to, you've got to be part of the process to say, look, this is, this is incorrect. Um, you, you can't do that. Um, and you, this is the consequences of those actions. And it's tough to do, um, you know, when you're 25 and yeah. the other guy's 22 or 23 or something like that, you know, like, it's it's that's a skill that that, that you learn. And I think that, that clubs are a lot better at it now than what it was when we we were playing. Um, but I think uh, in those tough sort of difficult periods that you um, you always need to still be a leader. You know, like you can't sort of become you can't let yourself be weighed down by everything else that's happening to you and the responsibility I always felt was uh, you know you've, you've still got to be the person who's got to lead here you know like as difficult as things are you can't just say um, enough's enough mm. it's an interesting one like I think I, I uh, was never a leader at a football club or anything like that but it's a hard one to when you're a young leader to to make comment and judgment on things when you don't think your backyard's cleaning yourself like that's a, that's a hard thing but it almost keeps you honest yeah it does it, it, it does the other thing is though like uh, the expectations of what we ask uh young people who are still you know learning about life themselves yeah. absurd you know absurd okay. really that you are saying to a 23 year old 24 25 26 27 like i need you to be the representative of this enormous organization and i need you to be the leader of this organization and you're like well if i knew what i was doing uh if i knew at 37 
what I know now and was able to apply that yeah. for 27, I'd be a much better leader. Yeah. But, you know, the, that wisdom it's comes after. Yeah, you know, like it, it that's comes the from thing. fucking everything up. That's right. You, because it's, it comes from mistakes. Um, mm. do, do you look at like um, Heppel now, for example, like someone who's a young leader doing, a, you know, really, he was doing, well, I, I think he is doing a great job. He do, he's doing what he can at the yeah. moment and think, you know, if you can see some similarities in in the pressures and stuff as a young leader for him. Yeah, I think so, and I think that he'll go. He'll look back in five, six years' of time and go, "Oh Same God, thing. wish wish I'd known uh, now." You know what I back then, mm-hmm. uh, and I could have applied it because it is that it's that is life. You cannot um, you cannot change that. It's like you only know what you know till you know it. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's my right. Quote, actually, I made that up. <laughs> um, biggest games, Anzac Day is huge. What's your biggest memories and favourite memories of, of some games that you just played on the big stage? Like, fuck, this is incredible. Yeah, it was always those those big games. I mean, we had we played in finals. We didn't have a lot of success in finals, but we played uh, Carlton in a final one day and got belted. But you know, like the those those big um, Melbourne rivalry games, um, Anzac Day, the Dreamtime at the G. Mm. Uh, they're just enormous occasions and they get bigger and bigger and bigger. And to the point where if you asked a Melbourneian what's one thing they should do, they would say you've got to go to Anzac Day to for a game. It doesn't matter who you support. you just got to go yeah. there. It's become an uh, institution in, as being a Victorian or a thing to do. It's almost like a, going to see the 12 Apostles. You know, <laughs> you've got to go to Anzac That's how important it is to the, the culture of this this country and this city now. And dream time at the G is getting into that same sort of stage. So when you're on the field there and you feel that um, energy in that environment um, and it, it really takes you to this place of enormous you know, gratitude and, and I always used to sort of be at the last post and just think there is no other place uh, on earth I would rather be right than where I am right now and there's no one that I would rather change uh, and swap with, you know, yeah. and that's uh, it's a very fortunate position to be in. Yeah, I think any any person that follows footy is, is so jealous of any Collingwood and, and Essendon and Richmond players who get to play in those games. Is there, is there a favourite win that stands out looking back now? Oh, I think certainly some of the wins of the 2013 season yeah. where we were in real, um, uh, really difficult spots um, were very uh, – like the, the team had such a close bond um, and the, the two Western Australian wins that we, we beat for our for a kick and uh, West Coast one night too. Um, they were probably like my, my almost my two favourite wins that I've ever played in. Mm. Huge. That time of the career, that's probably when things start to get a bit murky with with all everything that went on. Take us back to that time if you're happy to, where you're happy to go with that on what was happening when you first heard of the news and, and what transpired. Yeah, so it was probably, I mean, the 2012 uh, season was um, uh, like it was a strange one where we had a really good side. Um, we were going quite well, but then, you know, injuries sort of really faltered yep. and the, the club fell away and we missed the finals when really we, we were probably – um, we were we were a good side. We had a lot of injuries, and uh, we just sort of ran out of out of steam. Um, so we were setting ourselves up for. I thought um, we had a really good list, and and looking forward to the twenty thirteen season. Um, it wasn't until uh, a day or two days before the um, that press conference that um, we found out that there was anything wrong. Yeah. Um, and they came into the club and said, "Look, there's potentially going to be a." Um, an issue here. Um, we don't know, um, a, you know, what it's going to look like. We don't know what um, is going to be the outcome, but we will be part of a, an investigation. We think, um, and there were so many unknowns then, uh, and so many uh, things that you were sort of like, God, what, what the hell is going on? You know, like you, you're used to being the biggest problem is someone's gone out and got in trouble on the weekend and you've got to mm-hmm. deal with it on Monday. Like that is the world that you're sort of living in. That's a problem. Um, whereas this was of a totally different variety and, and different scale. And so there was an enormous amount of, um, you know, like fear and trepidation about that because there was so many things that seemed so foreign and s- externally very serious, you know, like it's the AFL world is a little bit of a bubble um, and it's reported on, but the stories are, you know, they're, they're pretty sort of um, repetitive, you know, coach gets sacked, someone goes out, does something stupid, like all these sort of things happen and mm. it's a wheel, whereas this one was totally separate and, and it was of uh, a far 
greater significance. I mean, the 2012 season, season there were problems internally, but that didn't, um, you know, didn't become an external problem until yep. 2013. But the if you think about a timeline, um, so 2013 is is heavily disrupted, and and there's a lot of uncertainties. Uh, 2014, we get a, a new. Bomber comes in, takes over as the coach, uh, but then there's the, um, the the case that gets that gets heard and and part of that that doesn't get resolved until the start of 2015, mm. just before the season starts. So that was a heavily disrupted year two. Uh, so it's only three year period there. Well, yeah, 2015. Um, we a week before the season starts, we get told that we can play. So you know, like we had up until that point, we had no certainty about whether or not we were going to be banned. And then halfway through 2015, they came out and said, uh, WADA came out and said that we will challenge the hearing. And so we had to go back to the uh, CAS, which was the um, the legal uh, court for that hearing that WADA had challenged, which didn't happen until November 2015. So I had to go up to, to Sydney and, and be part of that case. And then... Then we didn't find out until the middle of January that we were then banned. So that was 2016. So if you think about the timeline, it's sort of uh, 13, 14, 15, start of 16, you find out that you're banned for 12 months. So by that stage, I was, you know, exhausted and um, and just had had enough, really. Couldn't see myself being in Melbourne anymore, didn't want to be here. I found myself to be very uh it was a very unhappy place for me to be here. So uh, I really wasn't other than any reason that I felt it was really necessary to, to leave. You know, I didn't feel like I could stay here anymore um, and I didn't want to. So I always, you know, people always sort of like who travel, they like want to live in London or want to live in New York. For me, it was always New York, you know, like I had two friends who were there and um, I loved American sport. I'd always been a huge fan of um, the NFL and been to New York a few times. So I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm going, um, I'm leaving. And uh, packed up my bags, um, booked an Airbnb for two and a half weeks in, in Brooklyn and the left, everything else, I had no idea what I was going to do, but that's what I did. That's how I sort of left. Unbelievable. The but, saddest thing was saying goodbye to my puppy. <laughs> oh, no. So I, had a, I got a puppy, in, uh, a bulldog, and uh, uh, he arrived at the middle of November and then I had to say goodbye. <laughs> I was oh, in I'm, tears <laughs> when I had to say, give who him his last move in with? No, well, I lived with four other guys. Oh, okay. So they looked after him, but oh, I was devastated to, to have to say goodbye to him. What, um, and again, wherever you're happy to go with this, but like that time, I can only imagine – where you're at, like where you're at after a three year period, exhausting period, mentally, you know, you're the captain, you're the leader of this club, you're having to front the media, you have to front the courts, you're having to front the Australian public and be in the news about this stuff. Like how exhausting did that get for you? Like how were you, how were you coping? Um, well, I don't think that I was coping very well with it really to the point where I knew that I had to leave for my well being. Yeah. you know, like that was where I felt like it was at for me. Um, and it, life had become very, very, my world had become very small and become very insular sort of, and, uh, it was just, a. it was no, no longer a, a, a want. It was more I needed to, to get out of here. You mm. know, like it just wasn't, um, wasn't going to be sustainable for me to, to stay. What did, what did, um, what perspective did getting over to the States give you? Like what, what sort of process did you go through to, to get there and how, how did you feel when you got there? Well, I think the, the first time I felt like I was starting to, uh, begin to heal was I'd become so used to walking with my head looking at the ground in Melbourne. So I didn't have to make eye contact with people. And um, invariably you bump into a lot of things, but you, by the, I realized after about a week or two in New York, I started looking up when I was walking. And that was when like, you know, you go through these steps of a, a healing process. And that was sort of one of the things I thought, oh, I'm actually, you know, it's nice to be able to look people in the eye when you're walking past them or to be able to see things and, and feel like you're sort of engaging in a life rather than just trying to survive a life. Um, and so that was one of the first things that I sort of felt like I was, uh, there was some improvement being made. I can imagine that being such a, a crazy time as well, because you're in a, in Melbourne, you're probably one of the most well-known figures in the AFL land. You get over to a country, no one knows who you are, which is in some ways it's um, refreshing, yeah. as you've said, but also you, you're dropping your ego. You, you're starting from scratch. 
Yeah. Was that good? It was. Yeah. 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 For me, it was. It was what I wanted to do. Um, and uh, I, I just, I loved, um, you know, just being part of and immersing myself in a in a city or an environment or a neighborhood or what, uh, wherever I was and just um, absorbing it. You know, because I think that being here, it was there was I was trying to reflect everything and and um, and push everything away. Where uh, and so you just sort of like you're existing, but you're not really living. Um, whereas when I was over there, I started to uh, immerse myself in the environment that I was in, mm-hmm. um, and that became such a, a change from what I've been doing here. You you spoke about that healing process. The first step was to to lift your head. What other perspective did you get from being overseas? Like, is there anything really stand out to you now going, fuck, like, this was the moment? Because I think, you know, without going something so publicly like that, but when you are overseas and being out of your own country and being out of your bubble, you really do realise how small part you are. No matter how big a situation can seem, like, you're just a clog in a chain in this universe that you can really get out of. Yeah, you can get in your own world, can't you? Mm. And, and you become your own worst enemy. And so you're exactly exactly right. Like that, that perspective was such a um, like a, a wonderful thing. And, you know, you, you go in New York and uh, like people don't give a shit anything about you. Like that, that, that is the, the city, you know, like no one cares about your, your problems. No one cares about what you're doing. Everyone, there's just this, all these narcissists there who are only caring about themselves. But the city works, you know, like and yeah. that's – um, and that, so that gives you a great perspective of like, well, you know, there's no one here who gives a shit about anything about your life. So, you know, go and live your own thing, live your own truth sort of thing. So, um, you know, for me it was like I started to say, you know, like yes to things. I started to open myself up. Mm. I started to, um, you know, enjoy doing things again and um, and that was a real change, a real shift and, and that sort of opened up all these doors for me. Um, and that was that that mentality of you know like just wanting to try new things. What did you do? What did you do when you first went over there? So for work, almost the the, yeah. the first thing. So I had no job um, because I was on a um, tourist visa. Yep. obviously. Um, but I knew I needed to do something because I needed some sort of routine. You know, like you're in an AFL environment, you you're a beast of habit, yeah. really. Um, so I, one of my my good friends, she um, had been living there for a. a a longer period of time and she knew this guy um, who she'd worked and done some waitressing work with and she said, look, he's just started his own sort of coffee shop. Um, it's a newspaper stand inside a building on Fifth um, Avenue. Um, reach out to him and just see what he's doing. And that's what I did. I just went up there to his shop and I said, oh, you know, like, what are you doing? And he goes, oh, well, um, you know, I've got this um, and, uh, like, we make coffee and, and I've got a toaster and I can make avocado toast. <laughs> But, um, you know, I'm hoping to sort of expand it. I'd like to be able to branch out and do more. And I said, well, if you teach me how to make coffee, um, I'll work for free. And he said, yeah, sure, come. And so that's what I did. So two days a week I'd go up there and and, um, and I'd just, you know, be in this little uh, this newspaper stand with him and we'd just chat, you know, like and we'd just listen to music and I'd just talk to people who, you know, Americans would come in for a coffee and he'd teach me how to make coffee. And uh, I would work with some of the other, um, you know, people that he had there, some Americans who were, you know, working in in the hospitality world. And I just asked them about their lives and what they're doing and, you know, like they're studying and what, what, like just, you know, finding out perspective about what other people's, you know, existence was, you know, and not being so concerned or consumed by my own. Um, And it was, you know, it was wonderful. Do you think that, and again, this is a, I hope I ask this correctly, but like you look at all this um, adversity that you've been through in the years prior and then the experience that you've been able to get by moving over there, getting these new outlooks on the world. Do you look back at that now and go, it has been pretty incredible what you've been able to learn from a really shitty outcome to make the best of it? Yeah, I mean, I I think I am really thankful for everything that happened, you know, like uh, I wouldn't be in sitting in this chair now had I not had everything that previously happened to mm. me and and made the decisions that I did but those decisions were really forced upon me um, so I, I really am f- really thankful for what uh, I was able to do um, and I guess it was a byproduct of what I had gone through 
What what else transpired over there though? Because from there, you like you've got your own cafe in New York. Have you still got that? Yeah. So yeah. so that so, so that's little escalated hole, from that, that yeah, little like, yes, avocado yeah. stand. <laughs> and I hope you're getting paid for that now, by the way. Well, yeah. <laughs> we. I mean, I mean, it's too. And Barry is the the guy who started it. Barry yep. Dry, who's a, an ex um, Western Australian, and and his idea, you know, Bluestone Lane. And I know you, you've had Nick on the the show, so they were sort of starting to grow, um, and there was other. Uh, guys, Australian guys, the two hands guys were over there. They they were growing multiple stores and venues, and so Barry said, "Look, I really would like to grow um, this and and grow hole in the wall." and And so he's been able to do that, and and um, you know it's grown now into a like a, a, a much larger hospitality group mm. where it's got um, you know places in Dallas and Atlanta and Miami and Connecticut and New York as well. So he's grown a, a business, which is all credit to him and the, the people that he's employed. But um, it's been, I guess, just a someone who's gone over there, taken the chance, and and I've just been for, fortunate that our paths crossed at the right time. Incredible. What sort of life did you sort of create for yourself over there? Because I can imagine now you're living over there, building this whole new community a lot of players would have come over and friends would have visited you. You said you're big into the NFL. Like, is there any crazy experiences you look back now to how did I even get to do that or be <laughs> part of it? Well, I got to meet a lot of really, like there's a lot of really interesting people in New York, you yeah. know, like, and so you get to meet like all these really interesting people and they are doing interesting things, you know. So um, I remember we went up uh, for the 4th of July weekend, we went up to the Aridon- Aridondacks, which is like upstate New York, uh, and we went on this – uh, like canoeing trip in the forest uh, for like five days um, and through all these lakes and rivers and things like that and we just camped in these like um, just on the on the sh- side of a um, riverbank, you know, and, and I got to meet like people who were artists, people working in, in advertising and, and marketing um, and had those kinds of experiences with those people. And when you're in a football world and environment, you, you're very closed off to the rest of the society. Um, and I'd been in that for such a long time. So, you know, having those kinds of experiences um, and then, you know, those people are then saying like, you should go and do this. And so one of the guys on that trip said, look, I went and did um, some hiking in Norway. You should go and do that. It's really great. So that's what I did. I went and, and hiked, uh, you know, in Norway and then went um, and then someone else who I met on the there said, look, I, I was in Sweden for a few days. Um, you should go and do this, this and this. And, and so that sort of, it snowballs. Um, and when you've got, I, I had time, you know, and I was in a fortunate position to have the time, but, you also have the mentality to want to try more things and the more you try, the more you like and the, the more people that you meet, the more it feeds into it. it's like a spider's web. It starts and then sort of you know, goes out further and further. Isn't it funny, like, and this isn't a scenario for every person, but in, you know, sport and successful people, especially role models we look up to, we always think how cool it would be to know them. But you often learn things a lot more from just random people, random people that you've just come across in, yeah. in the space. Like, you know, I was – People will always ask me, like, you've been, you know, what's it like mm. playing with all these players and learning stuff from eight years of AFL? But I've learned so much more in the last two years of just interacting with just everyone. Yeah. You know, just, it's so much cooler. More, the, generally, the more inter- interesting yeah. people, aren't they? Because yeah. they're, they're having more uh, real life e- existence uh, and they're doing sort of things that aren't so necessarily choreographed or, or um, restricted. You know, um, and so that that is, the, I think, the thing that, that they have a bit more of a, a freedom of thinking. Mm. Is that the coolest thing you reckon you've done? The hikes? Um, for, yeah, there? it was the most most fulfilling sort of thing. Like that, that sort of uh, stuff. I mean, we we all went went uh, met up with the with the teammates, and we had a week on uh, in South Croatia. Like that was that was, <laughs> that was, a, that was a really oh, cool too. Okay, yeah. Very different experience, <laughs> but um, <laughs> equally as fun. But like that was. Uh, that was it. And then I, I, I met my I met my partner when I was over there and over that period of time as Did well. You meet her in the States or in South In New Croatia? York. Yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah, in New York. So uh and again that was the whole reason I met her was a culmination of all the events previously, you know, but you, you don't really realise that until you reflect on it. But the only reason I ever met her it was because of all these things that had changed in my life over that period of time. Crazy. What was it? How long were you there for? And then what was the decision to, to come home? Yeah, I was there for um, probably about nine months in total. Um, and it started to dawn 
on me as the timing became uh, closer and closer to having to make a decision yeah. that I had to come back and I didn't want to at all. I really I, – I changed my flights, you know, three or four times. I had to come back because my sister – one of my sisters was getting married and I had to come home for that. Had I not had sort of like a – definitive time you had to be home i don't know what i would have done you know like i really wasn't ready or willing to come back to australia and melbourne but when i did i guess i had to face the reality that i had to make a decision about whether i wanted to play anymore or not mm. um and i i maintained i really wanted to stay fit and healthy because i didn't want the decision have to have been because of bad um uh, I hadn't taken care of myself. And also, you know, I knew that when you're not in a great headspace, you know, exercise is really important. And for so, someone who's an elite athlete, to just cut that off would have been really detrimental to how I was feeling. Um, so I, I maintained that that training and that structure of, of training, but uh, I really didn't want to face the, the decision to, to come back and play so I put it off, put it off, put it off. Then I eventually came home and uh, sort of thought about it and reflected about it. And and for me, I felt like in the end it was uh, – it would have been a, a really difficult way to have ended a career. And I felt like I still had the desire and the want to finish something with the guys that I had been through it with. Mm. And part of that – I guess that arc of or the cycle of the what had happened was to close it off and to finish it on a good note. And a good note for me was to honour the last year of my contract and have a, a year of footy that was um, uninterrupted or unencumbered by what had taken place and it could have just enjoyed being back in, in the football environment. Mm. How was – like it's easy now to for someone who wasn't involved in that to think, you know, it seemed like it – you can't – things get normalised. Like mm. for that time, I feel like because of the, such breaking news, you can't be always on shocked on things. Yeah. But was it – a stri- what, what was that season like for you? Like do you, was it challenging, obviously? The the season coming back? Yeah, yeah it was challenging. I, I missed my life in New York yeah. and, and I missed um, – I felt like I was almost going backwards. You know, yeah. when, you know, in life you sort of feel like you want to be moving forward. Mm. Um, I felt like I'd gone back and, and I'd been exposed to pain again that I didn't really want – I thought I'd been able to put us behind me, um, and but it was also really it, the other part of it was it was really fulfilling. It was and it, there was that camaraderie that you that I'd missed and that I didn't have in that year off, uh, and that environment of playing and and you know being part of a club and a team I really enjoyed too. Yeah. Um, but I knew it was in the end for me. Um, I'm, I'm really thankful and glad that I uh, came back and played and finished my career that way, but I knew I was done. Yeah. Hey, what was that decision like at the end? It's always – no, it's not no. easy. No, even though I knew it was the right decision um, and that I, I was – it was time to walk away, it's still a really – um, difficult thing to come to terms with and to mm. say it out loud to people um, and to yourself. Um, and uh, I think I was fortunate that I was able to make the decision myself. So I can't uh, imagine how difficult it is when someone taps you on the shoulder Twice. to end it for you. Yeah. <laughs> Twice. <laughs> I'm hard. not trying to <laughs> twist the knife here, mate. <laughs> <laughs> it's but it's hard. tough. It, it's, yeah. it's really hard. Yeah. And, 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 and I found it was it was tough too. But that, when you finished as well, would, it, would I be right to say like it felt like, again, you sort of wanted to just break away, back away from footy again and do your own thing for a while again? Like did you go back to the States or did yeah, you just – Yeah, we did. Um, we went back there um, and I, and I, you're right, it was uh, – I wanted to be out of the, again. the world. Yeah. yeah. Um, and life moved on. You know, I worked – went on in, into my work – Role and and that's a really different transition to, to do, isn't it, for mm. for someone from, you know, the AFL world to to go into a, a working environment, um, but also family life and and a relationship and all those sorts of things that you 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 do tend to park as because you're such a selfish um, athlete who's only concerned with yourself and and your own world. So you start to build all these other parts of what life looks like, um, and and that process. What was the work life like for you? Is that because you've obviously got so many fucking things going on at the moment? You've got your Morning Joe, Infolio, Property stuff as well, as well as doing some Channel Seven commentary. 
how busy was it? How what was like t- the trajectory and the choices of those three things? So yeah, the, I mean the and the cafe stuff in the states as well. Yeah, the I guess the bulk of what I was doing was the the property advisors yeah. work, so the advocacy, um, and that was. Uh, like that's that's learning a new skill, you know. So anytime you're learning a new skill, it's a difficult process to go mm. through. Um, and then learning how the, the the business runs and 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 being in it day to day. So uh, I tried to um, um you know immerse myself in that. Um, and I would talk to my partner all the time about, you know, it's it, this transition is difficult. You know, like it's it's hard. And even though I have you know the structure of a of a job to go to and all that sort of thing, and she used to always say, like it's, you know, this this time and this uncertainty and this feeling of uh, of trepidation is is what you will look back on and be really thankful for because this is where all the growth comes. Mm. Um, and. And it is that that's that's what you learn as you're going through stuff. Is every time that you feel like this is really difficult and I feel really uncomfortable, it's that's when you're really getting some development, and and that's when you're really starting to branch out. Um, and so that that feeling, I think, is one where you start to trying to to replicate that feeling of being uncomfortable because you you're starting to feel okay. Well, actually, I'm learning new skills here. I'm learning more and more things. Um, and that's what I, I guess I've tried to do as um, I've transitioned out of f- the football world is to try and upskill myself in all, all different areas and, and different things. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I When I was at school, you know, I was probably a little bit like yourself. You think you're sort of too cool for it. Well, I did anyway. You know, <laughs> being, being smart is, isn't cool. But like now all I want to do is just learn shit. Yeah. And I I used to avoid as that young kid that we probably both were um, to an extent, you know, any 18 year old kid is you, you think you have the world figured out. You're very naive, mm. but the more time, and you want to stay comfortable. You want to stay with your friends. You don't want to put yourself out of your comfort zone, yep. but every single time, and this is just a trend through every show, anyone who's ever had success, um, or is successful in what they do has to go through that period of feeling like a fucking idiot and yeah. not knowing what they're doing. Cause that ultimately will lead to it. Like Brennan Bolt says it all the time, you know, get comfortable being uncomfortable. Um, I don't think you ever. Un- I don't think you're ever comfortable yeah. being uncomfortable. But I always think as like a trigger. Whenever I feel like this, I'm getting so much better in yeah. some way. Yeah, and it's it's difficult, isn't it? It's difficult to be comfortable like that because uh, your natural thoughts are, why am I putting myself through something that is making me feel bad or mm. making me feel worse about myself? Um, but that is how you learn new, new skills. And I guess it's referring back to what we talked about is that, you know, being in a hurry but, and being patient, uh, not being patient, but it's about climbing a ladder, understanding that you need to take steps. Um, and you can take those steps as quickly as you want, but mm. you need to take take them. From being in that period of, of leaving um, footy, retirement, going to the States, starting your businesses, building your life outside of footy, identifying, you, you know, who you are outside of, being an AFL player felt like, as you were saying before, you're sort of not, not avoiding, but just staying out of the limelight or out of the media, mm. the decision to come back to the media, um, and working in football, what, well, where was that? Like, did you always want to work in footy or was it something where in yourself you found like, you know, now I'm ready to come back and, and be in the media? Like how, how big of a process was that? Yeah, I, I think I probably before everything um, transpired, I, I thought that and felt like I wanted to um, have some sort of role in, in football, yeah. you know, like and I really loved the the game and the environment. That 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 changed as I went through what we went through. Um, and But I, I miss and I still miss, like you still miss the locker room, you still miss that environment. Um, and I felt like, uh, you know, the, the commentary on, on games was a, is a you know a great opportunity from from seven to be able to do it, but it was also a, a nice way to have a a feeling of the game and still have some some involvement, but it wasn't a consuming. You know, it's not my life. I don't identify sort of as a um, someone who really works in the media. It's, it's a vertical. It, yeah, that's <laughs> right. It it just is something that I, I enjoy because it gives me that um, reminder of of the world, um, and I'm trying to you know help educate. You know, people are what the, what I've learned over the period of time and and how I see the game, but I don't identify as that is my job. You know, it's something I do for fun, and that's what it is for me. You feel like I feel like from this chat that I've identified like how many different things, not just the footy knowledge, but business knowledge and learning and growth and all these experiences. 
would you ever want to go back into footy full time and pass that on, or is that something that you just you love, but it's not something you want to go back to? I think I, I've thought about it more um, recently. Uh, I always felt like it would be a great thing to do, you know, uh, when I was older. Mm. Um, my kids, are, uh, you know, like my kids are grown up, uh, and I could go back into the, that world out of a real desire to want to be back in there, um, not a fear of not leaving it and i think they're two very different things you know i think that you get you can get stuck in that world because you're not sure about what you're going to do outside of it yep. um and if for me it was very important to 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 leave uh and to to go out and, and learn new things and, and try new things and and educate myself and to get perspective and to to immerse myself in what the real world was but i would also also I think that the part of me would love to to go back eventually, um, with all that knowledge and all that perspective. It's well, that that is so exciting for any club because I think we look at a lot of past players now, and um, you know, not to say that they're doing this because of panic or anything, but a lot of past players retire and go straight into coaching roles, um, and and they're extremely passionate about it, I'm sure. But the amount that I'm sure you've learnt as we are aware today, post football and outside, and be able to bring that perspective back is so much more exciting than just playing for 20 years and then coaching for, for 30 years as well. You're sort of in one environment the whole time. I think it's really cool that people can get out and learn new things from other experiences. Yeah. I mean, it's just what I find. Yeah. That's what is I find fulfilling, you know, like that's me. Mm. Um, I don't think that there's any wrong or right, um, but that's what I would like to do. Mm. Um, what's next for you? Obviously, there's a lot going on. What's what's take, besides the family, what, yep. how do you breaking up your week at the moment within Folio? Morning Joe and the stuff in in the states. Um, well, the, the stuff in the states runs itself. Um, we like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Barry does a, a great job of uh, of running the whole um, uh, parched hospitality group, which is so th that is expanding. And um, for me, day to day, I think the the next real goal will be to try and grow Morning Joe. That's yep. um, that's what we would like to do. Um, grow that into a brand. We've got some some really, um, I guess, large targets that we'd like to to try and um, obtain and, and get to. What do you? What, can you tell us them? Are you? Do you put into the universe, or do you like to keep them secrets? No, I like to keep them okay. sort of okay. secret. Yeah, because yeah. 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 I'm the opposite. I sort you of like, like say project. it. Yeah. I say it before it's even happened, just yep. to like put the pressure on to actually go and do it. Yeah. 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 No, I, we've we've said it to myself and the other owners. We've said it okay, to each good, other, but good. Yeah. we'll keep. Because you guys are. Kumbaya ring together, correct yeah, around okay. the campfire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that that would be the. I think that if we could do that, I would find that really fulfilling and, and to go through that process. Um, and I, I love uh, you know working in property. I, I think it. Um, I think it's a great industry to work in, and um, I've really enjoyed it. So I'm gonna, I'll, I'll keep doing that at this stage, and um, yeah, there'll be something else that'll come along soon. I'm sure, there will. We should collab. <laughs> band or something. Um, just on an infolio as well, one of our fan favourites and alumni of Dylan Friends, Lynn Mithin. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah, she works there. We yeah. work together, Lil and I. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so she's a uh, – yeah, we uh, she we end up talking all kinds of things together. She's uh, very um, knowledgeable about the, the world and, and footy yeah. and uh, we, lo we love talking about footy with each other and she's great to work with. She's got a great um, personality and very vibrant and I really enjoy our time together. Awesome, mate. I cannot thank you enough for your time today. It's been incredible, so insightful. Um, and yeah, really, really blessed to, to build the relationship and, and be able to record it and let everyone share it. So thank you so much for your time. No problem. Thanks for having me. Thanks, mate.